topic is called the life of an artist. So that could mean a lot of things, but what we're going to ask is to discover the journey that brought each of these wonderful artists to the place that they are today. And they're hopefully going to be representative of our, our well, they couldn't possibly represent 100 artists, but there's so many stories here. As those of you who know that have been around, how many of you have been to the show before today? Anybody first timers? First time, well welcome, welcome. So, as you've discovered, you have the opportunity to walk around and um, just be at the elbow of the artist as they're creating art and you can ask them questions. But these art discovery series go a little deeper dive into discovering you know, the whole story behind the life of an artist. So, um, I'm going to introduce them from here, with your, your right to left, and then um, have them share a little bit more. But right next to me is Rob Stenberg, and um, Michigan native, but now resides in Mesa. How many Michigan people? Ah, there's always a Michigan contingent here. Okay, and then right next to him is uh, Vicki Grant, and she comes from all the way from North Carolina. Tar Heels, Tar Heels, anyone? Okay. And next to her is the lovely Gabriella Firehammer from the San Diego area. And originally from Argentina. Anybody from Argentina? Okay, we'll keep trying. And then, yeah, Carlos in the back corner, our other Argentine. And then uh, right next to her is Michael Jones from Big Fork, Montana. So um, I've had the privilege and honor of, of knowing each of these artists, some longer than others, but they all have fabulously wonderful stories. So we're going to start, as we usually do, just um, going down the line. And I'd ask you to tell us just a bit about you, uh, how long you've been an artist. Don't give away all the secrets, but um, maybe how long you've been in the show. So we'll start with you, Rob. Hello. Um, I've been here 17 years now. I'm kind of one of those old people I used to laugh at when I first started here a long time ago, <laughs> like Michael Jones. <laughs> Anyway, I uh, come from a different background. I was a healthcare consultant, and a hospital administrator for many, many years, and uh, didn't get burned out. Just got tired of doing it. Got tired of dressing up, to be honest with you. I like wearing red tennis shoes and shorts and flip flops and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was a point in my life where I just kind of looked at what I was doing, and I thought, if I don't try this art thing, I'm going to look over my shoulder and say, "What if?" The rest of my life, and I really wasn't prepared to do that. I wanted to kind of go for it. And I guess at the time it was a big leap of faith, but now it kind of worked out. I guess I know what I'm doing a little bit, so um, my story's a little bit different. Okay, um, I'm Vicki Grant. Uh, she said from North Carolina. Originally I have, was from Washington, D.C. area. My first career path was um, I decided to go to architecture school. I uh, graduated from architecture school, practiced for about 35 years. And so then I took my kids to ceramic class. I go, God, they look like they're having fun. Then I took a ceramics class, and then that's it. That was it. I just thought, I, it's time to make a change. This really speaks to me. It makes me incredibly happy. I only need to make myself happy. I don't have to make my clients. I don't have to make the code guy happy. I don't have to make my engineers happy. And that's what made me happy. Um, hi. Uh, let's see. So. As a little kid, I was incredibly stubborn. My parents would probably think I was kind of a pain in the butt. Um, I used to have screaming fits about being taught how to tie my shoes, so to this day, I tie my shoes weird. Uh, so that kind of tenacity is kind of what I'm about. I really want to figure out who I am. And um, I find that being an artist is the only way that kind of gets me really there. It tells me my own story to myself you guys. So uh, I was in the fashion industry for a while and um, I did artwear for the music industry. And then I made um, gloss mosaics and I carved stone with my husband for 13 years as a collaboration. And now I'm a painter. It's been a lot of change and a lot of fun. Kind of bring one thing from each to the next. 
And, um, and well, there I am. I'm here and I'm painting and I've been here for my third year in the show. This is a, a wonderful place to do what we do. It's um, a wonderful place to figure out who you are and for everybody to come meet you. So here I am. Awesome. Can you, can you picture, she's small but mighty, carving stone. <laughs> I've seen pictures of that, it's awesome. So, okay, Michael. Um, so I'm Michael Jones, uh, been in the show for 20 years. Uh, you know, I, I, since Susan asked me about coming up and speaking today, I've kind of thought about it and kind of where, where does a artist start? Where, where does that, that where, when do you become an artist? And the answer I came up with is conception. Yeah, I, I think that that's the way it works. I think you're born and, and, and you're an artist. And it, it takes a long time to get to that point and, and how, how fortunate we are to get to that point. So uh, I, my, my history is, has always been art. Um, elementary school, first grade, second grade, I was a kid that painted windows for the holidays at school. And then became, as a young teenager, I became involved with steel and welding and started doing sculpture immediately. Of course, that didn't pay the bills. So I, I, I became a, a um, nuclear certified welder for the U.S. government in the early 70s and, and did that and continued to, to do sculpture on the side until one day I couldn't do both. So that was 35 years ago. So it, it's just a... It's an interesting journey, and I'm sure we'll expand on that, and Susan will ask us some things, but uh, it's crazy good. <laughs> the life of an artist is good, but it's not all like easy peasy, eating bonbons, having palm fronds. So there's a lot of work behind becoming a professional artist, although I think, I think what we heard each of you say in one way or another is, it's, it gives you your freedom, your joy, it's happy, it's who you are, you couldn't do anything else. But um, sometimes, you know, we do have to be business people too, and balance that, and um, one thing that we love about the Celebration of Fine Art, our artists love, is that they get to stay put for 10 weeks, um, and many, if not most of the artists are also displayed in galleries across the country, but if you are not at a venue like this, the other option is to do a lot of weekend shows and um, talk about road warriors. I think artists put on more miles than almost anybody I know <laughs> traveling around, even getting here and going back and forth with materials. But um, I'll start with Rob and go down the aisle. So you, you made that big transition and you alluded to it a little bit, but can you kind of give us a little bit more about how you had the courage to go from corporate besides that you wanted to wear tennis shoes and short. We know the dress codes got to you, but what else about the transition was you know, life changing for you and how would you compare your life the way you live now compared to that? Um, for me, it, 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 I just got to a point where it wasn't fun anymore. I had no passion for it. And I, I'm originally from Michigan, as Susan said, and I moved out here 24 years ago. And I always loved art as a child. My, uh, Uncle was a very accomplished artist, worked in oils, did portraits and uh, still lifes, and he was a big influence. So I always had that kind of thing in the back of my head where the art was there. But when I moved out here, I saw so many art shows and so many galleries, and I just kind of got the bug again. And I knew I had to do it. Um, it. It was just an important thing for me because I was not real, I wasn't burned out, I wasn't terribly unhappy. I loved the money, I loved the perks. But it wasn't, just wasn't doing it for me. So I just thought about it and I kind of stuck my toe in the water a little bit and did some outdoor shows and had some success. Um, and it just became a passion. And I work a lot of hours and it never seems like work to me. And that's really, I think, when you know when you're doing the right thing. You know, being an artist, you wear a lot of hats. You wear, you know, you're the CFO, you're the CEO, you're the IT guy, you're the you know, director of marketing and advertising. So it's, it's, a, it's, you know, and first and foremost, you're a small business person. And that's why I tell a lot of new artists, I mean, you gotta be able to make money to have this career. And it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a fun challenge and I just love it. 
um, I'm doing what I really want to do. And boy, a lot of people can't say that. To me, that's real important. And that was the real motivating factor for me. Um, I, um, I only do original work and I, I'm giving out a piece of me when you buy uh, one of my paintings, or one of my mixed media pieces. And there's a lot of heart and soul that goes into these things. And I really want the client to really like that. This is actually a piece that's done on a wood board. This is vintage uh, tin ceiling tile that was salvaged from a building in the state of Iowa, some small town, which I can't remember. Um, I'm constantly pushing myself, trying to do different things because I'm never satisfied with what I do. Um, but connecting to the client's a big thing for me because they're getting a piece of me and I want them to be happy. And it's a real important connection. and. Um, a lot of thought goes into the process of uh, selling a piece to someone and uh, there's a lot of me in this piece and I convey that to them and it's just a real important thing. You're quite a storyteller, aren't you? I am. <laughs> just ask me. <laughs> so Vicki, you, you alluded to it like you, it was immediate for you with the ceramic. You knew you had to do it. Was it did it take courage though to, to move from what you knew to the unknown? So to me, the threads are endless between architecture and art. Um, think about it, um, you're really, you're, you're trying to serve humanity. I mean, you are really trying, I did a, most of my work was uh, university work <clears throat> and religious work. And so you're really trying to help those teachers so they can help their kids. And you're really trying to help the, the church, so it, it, it really does speak to the con congressional people, the, the people in the church. And, and also, there's a lot of threads from architecture, materials, form, function, pattern, color, and it all connected very easily for me. Was it hard for me to make that transition? Um, no, it was just very seemed very natural and very easy, but remember, 35 years is a long time to do a, one profession, and I felt like it was time to do something that was just, like, for me, clay is very textural, very hands-on, and I didn't get the opportunity to do that, other than I did build a lot of models, but other than that, you know, just working with materials, working with color, and having total control over it, and not having to yell at your mason. So, you know, that was one of the things that I really enjoy is having total control over my product. Which is, Which is your piece? Oh, oh, sorry. Mine is this. It's too heavy for me to pick up, I think. <laughs> Michael can do that. He's much stronger. It's, it's no, no, no. high there. Oh, it's I'll tight. Walk. Okay. <laughs> So, kind of like I was saying, color, texture, pattern, rhythm, you know, I'm putting all that texture in there, I'm putting the materials in there, a lot of my, um, a lot of my pieces are very highly detailed and highly, um, like, a lot of elements that are added to it, but this is, you know, this is um, African pan reed, these are African glass beads, this is bamboo, these are pods you can find in our parking lots around here. So I like collecting things. My studio is nothing but bin after bin after bin of collected fun stuff. And the other thing is, I really do feel as though in all of my design work in architecture too, you have to go back to the scale and relating to the people that are using it and I find it's fun that people come back year after year. I've been here seven years, by the way, and they say how much they enjoy it every single day. And so you know you're connecting with your people. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing up here is um, a call to passion. For me, it's like that too. I feel that um, in a way, love flirts with everybody through art. It's a visual language that as an artist we create personally over years and years and years defined by what it is we desire or like a child comes and plays with 
the shapes and the colors it likes. And it's really about expressing, well for me, the unconscious and to get into flow, the challenge of uh, flow is like when you're driving along in your car for a really long time and you realize, wow, I, had, I have no idea or recollection of the last five miles I drove. <laughs> that, that place, if I can get to that place, which seems to be like a, a river that you step into that's always there, um, then that's my happy place. That's the, the beauty of discovering who I am and letting that flow out onto a page. Um, my paintings are made of beeswax and pigment. I use the beeswax because it's very ethereal and dreamy. And it creates an atmosphere that I hope kind of sucks the viewer into the painting and gives you a restful, beautiful place to be. It's an expression of who I am down through and through and to the bottom of my soul that takes or has taken me years to dig around and mull through all the parts I think are there to figure out what's really there. That for me is the journey of being an artist and it's a gift to me and a gift to you and in a way a gift to anybody who's around it or part of it or viewing it. Passion being the only commodity worth anything, it was an easy choice to be an artist. I don't think I really had a choice. Um, I just kind of let it take me along. It's been a fun ride. Thanks, Gabby. And I'm glad to use the word, word ethereal because every artist here is so unique and brings her own blessings, but Gabriella has such a calming deep intuitive spirit that you know you it's hard to walk through your space without feeling absolute calm and awe and I think I, the next thing I'm going to ask you is about becoming a partner with your husband but we're going to skip to to Michael I mean you already told us from from childhood you knew you were an artist you just did the sidebar to pay some bills but being an artist to you is like breath it, it is it, it's um it's passion. You know, so a couple of things have been said. I don't, I think art is passion. And I think every artist in this show is passionate about what they do. And I think if you ask them about that, you're gonna, you're gonna get a little bit deeper than just what you're looking at. There's gonna be a lot to feel. I don't think you'll see any more spiritual art in this show in Gabriella's. It, it is unbelievable work. Rob, Rob says that, that when everybody, when you get a, a piece of his, you get a piece of him. And I think that's absolutely valid. Uh, uh, people are passionate about what they do. And, and we, we, all, we all see art hanging on the walls and, and we see that but what has gone into that just to get to this point? Uh, th this is the, the, the cherry on the cake that we get to, to be here and, and, and you get to see it and we get to talk to you and, and let our passion come out. But there are hours and hours and hours of solitude, of, of work, of, of following that passion, of, of figuring out how you want to do it and, and, and what's it going to relate to. For me personally, uh, I, I'm inspired by, by just about everything around me. I, I've always, uh, or organic things. Uh, I am from Montana, and uh, just the lifestyle and, and being where I am it inspires me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this piece a little bit if I can. And so, my, my reads, some people call them twisty things. I'm not offended by that. So, so th this was inspired by my wife and I having a picnic um, in our yard, and I'm, I'm sitting on blanket on the lawn and looked over at my grass, and I thought, I need to mow my grass. <laughs> uh, and, and 
then, then you look deeper and you're looking at individual grass blades and that, that movement and that interaction of those grass blades. And so that's, that's where that started. Uh, then it's gone on for generations and it, it's all about capturing light and capturing movement. Um, I, I look out the McDowell's and how, how, how blessed are we to be here to have this as a backdrop for a show. And, and you'll, you'll see so much wildlife art here and, and the things that are just related to, to the, those individual things that you see. And every artist sees it different. You, you know, you, you, you can give a dozen artists a subject matter, let us do a sunflower, and you're going to get a dozen different things, and they're all going to get to it. So, when, when you get to follow that passion, it, it, it's, as Rob said, not, not everybody gets to do it. So I don't think there's anything, anybody here that's not thankful for that. How many of you have ever looked at grass and decided to create some magnificent <laughs> sculptures from it? <laughs> Makes mowing your grass to a whole new level. Very yeah. good. Yeah. So one thing I hear a lot of our visitors ask a lot, and we're going to put all of you on the spot, where do your ideas come from? And I'm going to start with you, Rob, and I'll skip to you. That is probably the hardest question I ever get asked. Where do you get these ideas? Because I have a zillion and one ideas all the time. I am very blessed. I don't ever have artist block. Um, I write things down in napkins, on pieces of paper, um, my arm. Um, I just see things and I get ideas. I see the way the light hits a, the, on a building and it creates a shadow. Um, that's my ideas just come from all kinds of different sources. Um, my art, most of it I like to be happy art. I want to make you smile, to be honest with you. All my animals are smiling. So it's, you know, it's life's too short. Life's too intense these days. And if I can bring a smile to your face, you get up every morning, have your cup of coffee, and look over one of these crazy horses with bears riding on its back. Oh, hey, that's going to be a good day. But uh, my ideas come from all different places. And I'm inspired by a lot of things. Um, my clients inspire me. Some of the best ideas I've ever had are, are as a result of uh, a client giving me an idea for a commission that will just end up branching out into a whole other um, genre that I'm doing, a whole other line of, of paintings. So um, it just it comes from everywhere. It just comes from life. I mean, I just really love what I'm doing. There's no limit to where you can put art. Can you tell us, share a little bit about the, a magnificent kitchen design you did? Is that alright? Or do you not? Okay, go for it. Um, well, what Susan's referring to, I had a client that I sold a piece of art to, oh well, gosh, a number of years ago. I do some very elaborate, I call them warriors, they're kind of Indian figures. Um, by the way, I don't look at anything for reference, everything's completely out of my head. I've never looked at anything, so I don't need it. Um, but I had a client who bought this, you know, five feet by four feet, there was all these warriors lined up. And they loved it, and they put it in their house, and they bought a new house, and, and they basically tore this house down to one wall. And they were going to do this wall in the, the kitchen of Missouri Barnwood. And they kept saying, we want you to do your warriors on that wall. And I said, okay, what, you know, whenever it's ready. Well, that conversation went on for four years. And um, frankly, at some point, I thought, we're just pulling my leg. This is never going to happen. And I had made some sketches when we first talked. And then four years later, I got a phone call. We're ready. And I said, okay, so am I. So I came out to the house and they had some of the barn wood, just a chunk of it. And I said, can I have a couple pieces and I'll do some colors for you. And I'll do a sample of what I want this to look like. Um, and the wall was, I don't know how big it was. The, I did three characters seven feet tall. Um, it was kind of a challenge because I'm not good at measuring things, so I had to make a big stencil and kind of go from there. But the wall concealed a refrigerator and a freezer with handles. And it was one of those kinds of things where you push the cabinets open. And I tend to kind of push hard when I paint, so I was constantly hitting myself in the face with the, with the cabinet drawers. But, you know, I, I sat down and created this thing, and then they, I, 
they looked at it and they said, go for it. And they weren't in the house yet, so it took me about two and a half weeks. I just would pack a lunch and an iPod and go to town. And um, it, was a it was probably one of the coolest pieces I've ever done. It was in Phoenix Home and Garden. It was featured in that. Um, but those are the kinds of things that are really fun. And I've also painted hoods over stoves with horses and all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm kind of known as the guy who'll paint on anything, to be honest. But um, yeah, that particular piece was really kind of special. So still is probably the best thing I've ever done. Well, you've done lots of good stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so Vicki, ideas, where do they come from? That's a very easy one for me because it's Mother Nature. I have a whole series that I've been doing now for about eight years and it's called Windows to the Earth. And it's a portal in my clay. And that portal has something that is from Mother Nature, be it a shell, a fossil, a crystal, a geode, or a collection of things. And it is the inception of the piece and it tells me everything about what that piece is going to be, from the, the design, from the coloration, um, all the embellishments that I use, down to the very tiny little signature um, emblem that I put down at the very bottom right. So to me, Mother Nature is it. It's, it's what I respond to. I went on a trip to New Zealand several years ago and everything in my life is in my sketchbooks. I sketch all the time. I have hundreds of sketchbooks. And so my girlfriend and I were, were seeing New Zealand, and one day she opened my sketchbook, and she says, is that what we saw? <laughs> she says, I don't remember any of those things. I don't remember those places. Of course, she was on drama main some of the time, but but really and truly, I sketch all the time, and it is inspired in total by Mother Nature. This one wouldn't that be a treasure trove to find all their little sketches on napkins and sketchbooks? It's just everything. It's all sketches. One time I was trying to explain to a friend of mine who's very, um, the other side of the brain. Yeah, right brain. Right brain. And he was working with a sculptor on a piece, and he said, I told him to sketch it, and I said, well, you don't understand, he thinks in 3D, and where some of us would write words, you communicate everything to yourself through visual drawings and pictures. It's interesting, when I was leaving architecture and all the young kids coming into architecture, I, every time I have an idea how I portray my thoughts to my clients, how I, I would sketch 3D. My mom said I was drawing in perspective at age five. I don't really believe her, but she said that. But I would draw everything and I knew how to, to portray my thoughts and what I wanted to say to my clients through sketching. You look at kids coming out of college today, they don't know how to draw. They know how to work the computer so daggone good, it is unbelievable. They can do a 3D model in the same amount of time and they can rotate it and you can fly in and out of it. But I realize that that skill set that I have, I have taken right into my artwork as well. Yeah. No matter who you are or what you are as an artist, it's been done before. It was done prehistorically. And it, it can be two lines across the canvas. And, and I've I'm, I'm just always been intrigued by the simplicity of, of, of lines and, and, and geometrics. So, so that, that's, that's a, a whole another body of work for me. Uh, uh, I, have to, I have to mention uh, my arrow, which I call the great arrow out here. Uh, that, that's one of those pieces that uh, you're, you're driving down the road and you, you, you look out and the sunset and, and you, you see these rims and you just think there ought to be a, a giant piece out there. And that, that's kind of how that comes about. So it's just, I, I think 
I think all artists probably have visions, but I think they really have visions on on an idea and and how to create that idea. And, that, and that's where it goes into such individuality. It, it, it can be that vision, but everybody's gonna see it just a little bit different. So, uh, on a lighter note, I, I, so if you haven't seen that arrow, you gotta look at that. If I had a gentleman come through the other day, he comes around the corner and I'm standing there in my spot, and he looks out the arrow, he looks back at me, and he says, boy, are you lucky. I said, okay, how's that? He said, they just missed you. <laughs> That's good. I still like the story. The, the first year that Michael had art in the show, he physically wasn't here, but he was participating in the sculpture court. And it was, we were still down at Highland and Scottsdale Road. And a guy walked in the front door and walked straight across, didn't even stop at the at the gate, and he said, I want that arrow. I'm like, okay. And he said, I didn't get a car at the auction, so I have X amount of dollars to spend. Can you call him up and see if he can deliver it to Beverly Hills? And I said, okay. <laughs> so, so that was, after that, Michael said, okay, I think I need to be down there. So. Yeah, that, that, that was Gino, and he didn't get a 55 Chevy that he wanted. So. Darn it. There's more 55 Chevys, but that era was very special. And I do happen to know that some of your ideas, because I've heard you talk about them, creativity strikes us at, at night in dreams. Um, you had a commission a few years ago that the idea came to you and you used... I, I don't know this personally, I've heard you say it. Karen probably could share. Uh, okay, so we're, yeah, we're going in. So a, a very dear friend of ours and, and, and of the show uh, uh, who passed away last, last, last summer, and we're sorry to say that. But, uh, anyway, I, I had, uh, he was interested in a gate for his home, and which, which is locally here, and, and so uh, kind of got a feel for what he liked, and then I, I, I drew up the design, and no, he wasn't quite, didn't want to go down that road. How about something like this? And, and so I, I did start over another design, and, and it, it just was kind of shocked. No, that's not what I want. And, and I told him right there, I said, I'm tired of trying to design what you want. I'm going to design what I want to design for you. And, and so uh, I, I'm an Aquarius, and I like water, and so I, I take long showers. And, and I started sketching that on the shower wall in the steam. And, and he made me tell everybody that that's where the design came from. <laughs> Truth. True, true story. And uh, he, was, he was great fun to work with, and we do miss him. But um, I, now I've lost my other train of thought. But the, this morning, we always have a Friday morning meeting for the artists, and we just share different things. And uh, for whatever reason this morning, I brought up the concept of music and you think about a movie and if you take away the soundtrack what happens to the movie the impact dramatically goes flat and one of our missions is to share art with as many people as possible and have them experience how art can lift you up and make you happy and provide it a beauty in your life and while you guys were talking, I just thought to myself, what would it be like if there was no art in the world? Think of that void. So, in a, in a great way, you're all serving mankind, and I think we've talked about that by telling the stories, helping us to see ourselves better, and you know, expressing, in your view, the, the beauty of the world, and sometimes trials and tribulations, but... Um, and Gabby, you know, we talked about the fertile soil here and how much creativity happens among yourselves. Are any of you interested in sharing about that and how the the, the tribe here lifts each other up? Um, well, not to take it back to my husband, but um, we created our work together in collaboration for 13 years and at the end of the day we would often, after working on the same piece of art or two separate pieces of art, 
would have a glass of wine and sit and really spend time looking at what we had made to figure out what made it work, to discuss it, to critique it, to push it along, to have a forward movement of pushing for the artwork to be a conscious expression of who we are. Um, so that collaboration in this tent becomes really powerful. Um, there comes a point in a piece of artwork sometimes when an artist ceases to be able to see what they're seeing because they're so close and emotionally attached to what they're making that it creates a little fog. And another artist could come along and light a light bulb over your head because they're putting fresh eyes on it. Um, that is a, a beautiful thing. It creates an intense feeling of camaraderie. It creates a village, a pretty open place. And, um, and part of that fertile territory, part of the passion, part of the synergy. Uh, by the time the show's over, we've all told a hundred coincidental um, stories about clients and friends and things that we saw and maybe all of that is an evolution and maybe that since art I think is food for the soul maybe that's that's what keeps us all human and loving and compassionate in a really great way. Don't you all think we need more Gabby's in the world? Yeah. <laughs> we could send you into some of the places of conflict and you could resolve it. <laughs> I'd like to say just that, you know, if you're listening to Gabby's words, I think it's going to become very obvious here that this is so much more than an art show. That this is a community. It's a community of artists. It's a community of collectors. Uh, and, and that's why uh, it all works. That's why we are all here but you know it, it, it's all this energy the uh, artists don't succeed without your your energy as well but rob rob talking about brainstorming sessions the, some of the greatest pieces come from those brainstorming sessions you know that the, the, you get to push artists to a different spot or, or or make them think of something different a different route to get to a place so it, it really yeah, this is an amazing place. And again, so much of that comes from the visitor, the collector. When you walk in, you can speak to how that has influenced your work. Well, it's, it's pretty cool when your job is, you're sitting there painting on something and somebody comes up and says, God, I love your work, it's so beautiful. I mean, most jobs you don't hear that, you know? I mean, that's a pretty good feedback and you get it every day. At least I hope I get it every day, but. Um, it sure makes you feel good. Um, this place is is uh, unique. Um, I don't know how quite to describe it to you all because it's kind of a feeling that envelops you. The greatest growth period for me in art was the first year I was here. I grew as far as ability and confidence um, tremendously in that first 10 weeks I was here. And it continues to do it every year because you just you're around all these really cool people, and you know they just have so many great ideas. They're such wonderful people. They're kind. They're generous. They're just super talented, and it rubs off on you. And it's really cool. Um, it's it's a very very nice, very um, peaceful environment. I mean, it's just a great deal to be in. And I'm just I, you know every time I show up here in January. Oh God, I do this again. Um, I'm really happy because it's really a lot of fun. And I just meet some wonderful people and the clients are just super. I mean, they're just, you know, everybody's in here loving art. What better environment could you have? I, I've forgotten what our subject is really supposed to be. Um, at this point in time. But I will say that I work collaboratively with um, several of the artists here, and I find it energizing. Um, my media, it will only go so far as far as bigness. Um, I've worked with our weaver, Mel, um, Montana Blue Heron, 
on several pieces in the last couple of years, and we can actually go five or six feet. And for me, that is just really cool to be able to get out there and be that big. So I've enjoyed that energy, and you, when you're working with somebody else who has kind of a, um, a similar um, aesthetic, and they have their way of going, and you have your way of going, and who knows how that could turn out, because usually, in, in my case, I'm so excited with how the two people can come together and bring some amazing things that couldn't have happened just with my work. So that can only happen in this kind of environment, where you're working with someone day in and day out, and you get to see somebody and respond back and forth with that person, and it's a blast. It's just a blast. It, you already did. Okay, so it is, for us too, it's amazing to watch the artists interact with each other and in a lot of ways you, people might consider this a competitive environment because they're all here to share their creativity but they're also here to, you know, make a living. Um, so I think as artists, your job is to mind the only thing that you own that is completely authentically you which is your voice um, there could be lots of singers there could be lots of dancers and lots of painters and no two will look alike and what's important is to have your personal stamp on what you do to figure out why you want to make art to figure out why you're called to make art and to create with prolific abandon. Um, when, when God wants to give you a sunset, he doesn't give you one, he gives you a different one every day for your entire life. He doesn't make one bug, he makes thousands of kinds of bugs. So paint 400 paintings and then see where you are and then the world will want them and you just have to be willing to have the courage to stand out there with your heart on your sleeve a little bit yes you have to make practical decisions yes you have to learn to finish your work beautifully and put lots of love and lots of hours into it but if you do that it's like that field of dreams they will come the work will sell I don't Maybe a more, I think this is what you're looking for. Um, like I said before, you, first and foremost, you're a small business person. I mean, you wear all these different hats, and, and it's difficult because the best thing we do is create, and that's, you know, you got to fight against doing it because there's other stuff. You got to get your website in line, you got to have your business cards done, all that kind of stuff. One of the biggest pieces of advice I could give you um, is to befriend an artist or ask an artist, how did you get where you got? How did you do it? Because um, I do that all the time. I had two guys that really helped me way back when. And I'm a strong proponent of paying it forward. So I met a, an artist, for instance, on Instagram, and I really liked her work. And I said, have you ever heard of the Celebration of Fine Art? She goes, no. I said, well, I knew she was in Arizona, and turns out she was five minutes from here. So I said, why don't you come down and check it out? Because I think she'd do well here. Um, so she came down and then I, she started asking me a million and one questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you get into that show? How do you get into this show? How do you market yourself? And I just sat down with her and told her what I do and what others I know that are successful do. So I think if you do that, you'll be farther, way farther ahead in the game than just going out there blind. Um, there's always somebody in any profession that's kind of your mentor and will help you. Um, and if you need any advice or you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Not a problem. So for me, um, I feel as though the hardest part because like I said, my professional career as an architect, I kind of knew how to do an awful lot of that other stuff. And But the hardest thing, I think, and I would tell any person who wants to be an artist, is to find out who you are as that artist. Find out 
what work you have to bring to your media. Um, people come by, I'm sure all of us, and they look at your work and they analyze it. And they're looking at it and they want to take pictures of it. And, I, and they go, can you take pictures? And I said, sure, take pictures. Because no matter, in my opinion, no matter how many pictures you take, if you take the piece and turn it inside out, and you try to do it, it is not going to come out the way I do it. It's going to come out the way you, your brain is going to make it come out. And be honest with yourself of what that is. And, and make sure you understand you, it has to be you that is coming out. And that takes time. And that takes practice. And that takes, like Gabrielle was saying, analyzing what it is that calls you about a particular piece. So to me, that was the hardest part, is to find out who I am trans, from coming from an architecture standpoint where I have different projects every month, to what is a cohesive group of work that is you. All excellent, spot on advice. As, the, as one of the ones who juries the show and runs the business end here, I'll give you some of my advice. Listen to what they said. We can tell immediately when we get an application from an artist who doesn't know their voice. That's trying to paint what they think will sell or they're painting a little bit of everything. It's okay to have different subject matter. It's okay to have different medias. But if it's, if we see somebody that's trying to be a little bit of everything that hasn't found their voice, they're, they're not likely to be juried in the show. So that is excellent advice. As far as other business things, a business plan, I highly recommend it. There's a million thousand books and things online that you can find about that. Um, I agree with the concept of create what you, is you and the world will find it. But I also know that you can have the most wonderful thing in the world and if people don't know about it, it doesn't happen. So for, on our end, we, we invest a lot in marketing the show. We very carefully select the places that we market, meaning you can spend your money on advertising widespread, cast a wide net, but it's better to target it to the audience that is probably most receptive to your message. Um, so I would say carve time every day to, you know, discover who your, your people are and invest in people skills, especially if you want to sell your work. We have had wonderful, wonderful artists here in the past that are not at all comfortable in this venue. And in that case, you want to find an excellent quality gallery with integrity that you can partner with. And it should be a partnership. We have a high level of trust in our artists and they in us. Um, everything we do has their best interests at heart and um, we are here to serve them and, and that's why our partnership works so strongly with, with these people. Um, and keeping good records I think is important. A lot of artists don't like to do that. Many artists have a great partner that helps manage that. There's a program called Artwork Archive, is that what it is? Does anybody remember from our first meeting? I think it's called Artwork Archive. It's for artists to archive everything and also for collectors. So you keep a record and be consistent in your pricing and be, you know, whatever you decide to price it at, be confident in it. Don't, you know, price it super high because I always say people don't price it to keep it on your wall, price it to share with people. But when you can't keep up with the demand, you know you need to raise your prices. So those kinds of things, I think, and definitely a mentor. M mentorship is probably one of the best ways in any walk of life to grow and, and get the knowledge. It's better than book work, for sure. Um, I just wanted to add that um, oftentimes people come into my booth and they ask, how can you part with this work? Because it's so close to who you are. And um, I think it's really great to fall in love with the process of making the work. Because then the object itself becomes secondary in a way to what it's actually doing to you and other people and how it affects the world. Art is service and at the same time it's 
the right kind of selfish. It takes tenacity for sure. You gotta want it. It's not an easy thing, but it's the most joyful thing you can do if that's what you're called to do. <laughs> um, and all I can say is go for it. Absolutely. Did that help? Okay, great. And we have a question right here. How do you feel, the, the whole process of creating is very understandable, but I'm thinking about the buying and selling. How do you feel when people look at your work but maybe they don't buy it. You feel bad that they've missed out on what your vision was or just think it wasn't for them? Or in the early days, were you desperate to sell so that you could actually put food on the table? You know, I mean, there's a practical part of life too. Right. And how do artists balance that? So for our online viewers, the question in a nutshell is how do you balance you know, the, art, the business of art and how do you manage if people don't buy and you don't, do they connect or not connect, that kind of thing? That's a, that's a very good question, and sometimes it's very frustrating because you put your heart and soul into something and, you know, like, they don't get it. Jeez, what don't you get? It's beautiful. Um, I believe there's a home for every piece, and sometimes it just takes a little longer. So you have to kind of take that long view instead of the short-sightedness. I mean, it can get very frustrating. Um, many of us do outdoor shows, and they can be real frustrating in many ways. Um, from weather to dogs peeing on your booth to people, you know, just being mean to you. But um, I had a, a, my biggest piece um, in my studio that sold yesterday. And I was quite, you know, upset because it wasn't going. And I thought, this is the best piece I've ever done. What the heck? And I had a couple come in and I took it out to the house and we put it on the wall. And I went, well, that's a no-brainer. That's where it goes. I mean, this is a slam dunk, and I said it's found its home. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, I used to get a little frustrated, but I've been doing it long enough. It just kind of like water off a duck's back. You just, this is part of the, the process and part of the business. And it can be frustrating, but most of the time it's really rewarding and a lot of fun. So um, I, this is the only show I do. And it, it's a long haul, but it's the only show I do. I, I just do galleries, and what you miss in doing galleries is you all. So I have no idea who has my work when it sells in a gallery, because they don't want to share that information. I have no idea why they bought it. I don't know if it's in their living room or in their basement. I have no idea where it goes, but this show has shown me that it's about you all, and you may be having a, good, a bad day, and you may have had an argument with somebody, and you may go through my booth and not take one look at my stuff, and you just keep going, or you may bring three of your friends, and you guys are talking, and you're not paying any attention to the artwork, and that is life, and that is you all. But then you have people equally that will come in and go, oh my God, this is the best spot. I love everything. And that's what makes it all work. And I love that I get to meet you all, talk to you all, and I know how you feel about that piece. And they send me pictures. Oh, I love it. It's right here. Here's a picture of where its final home is. And that's what speaks to us and makes us keep doing it. 